morning. Good morning. Uh, first, uh, thanks to you to the, for the kind words of introduction. And I want to thank uh, my longtime friend, more than 35 years, uh, your dean, Dr. Maurice Daniels. Give him a hand. When I graduated from law school, I think it was the same year that he came on the faculty here uh, as an associate professor, and uh, we worked together on many, many projects over the years, developed a friendship. Uh, my wife, his daughters, my daughters, his wife, and, and I've watched him uh, grow and prosper uh, here at the University of Georgia. And uh, before he became dean, I want you all to know as social workers, uh, he was a fighter in the community, and he still is. And uh, we marched together. Matter of fact, we marched on the president's house one day. How about that? Now the current dean, give him a hand for that. Isn't that fun? Uh, arguing for more resources and opportunities for minority and female students here at the University of Georgia, more African Americans and minorities on the faculty uh, and other issues. And Dr. Uh, Daniels, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Dr. June Gary Hobbs, thank you so much uh, for uh, thanking me and supporting me and, and, and extending this invitation. And to the students gathered here, congratulations, first of all, for having answered the call for public service, and particularly in the area of social work. And there is no more noble a calling uh, than to have answered this great call to serve uh, the citizens of this state and our nation and really people all across uh, the world. Uh, one of the unique uh, aspects of having answered the call to public service, and Dr. Clayton is here, another longtime friend. We work together on many issues uh, in the Atlanta area. Uh, one of the most important things when you answer the call to public service, and you are public service, particularly uh, because you chose this field of endeavor, is that you have and you do not have the opportunity to select the people you will serve. They will what? Select you. And so consequently, as you leave uh, the University of Georgia and go into your various fields of endeavor, take with you the understanding is that you are going to serve and that it's, it's a blessing to have been called to serve. And although you will have uh, BA degrees and masters and PhDs, uh, one of my favorite sayings is one that uh, Dr. King uh, voiced on several occasions. And it's simply this, that, you know, you really don't need a college degree in order to what? To serve. Good to have, but you don't absolutely have to have one. You don't really need to know Einstein's theory of relativity in order to do what? Serve. All you really need is a heart full of love and a soul generated by grace. That's what service is all about. And I've been blessed to have been given the opportunity to serve the public in many ways as director of the Department of Family and Children's Services. And I look at that particular experience as the one that is most defined and informed my career. And as we move forward in the 21st century, I submit to you that you are the ones who will pay and continue to play a critical role in shaping the destiny of this nation. America and the world is crying out for men and women who have tough minds and tender hearts. <laughs> This profession demands that you have tough minds and tender hearts. Tender minds and tender hearts won't get it. Tough minds and tough hearts will not get it. You must have both in order to be effective. Particularly now, in, at this point in the economic history of our nation. And let me stop. You are here because you want to serve, right? Oh, yes. Or are you here because you just want to get a job and make some money? <laughs> get rich. <laughs> How many people came not because they wanted, why are you majoring in this particular area? Are you 
interested in serving. Yes? <laughs> well, don't be ashamed because service is good. Now, because you've decided that you wanted to serve those who have less and may need more, you do understand that you will be criticized because of your desire to do what? Serve. Some folks are going to accuse you of being liberals. Oh, my God. <laughs> Am I right, Mr. Associate Dean? Yes, sir. I'm very right. You're very right. <laughs> and not just those will criticize you, but many of the folks that you try to serve are going to despise you because you provide you try to provide the service. Have you all been in internships or jobs in, in, in social work already? How many people have already worked in the area? That is great. Now, how many of you all been cussed out by a client or a customer? <laughs> yeah, email too. Yeah. Email. Tell us about it. What was that like? Stand up. Let, let your colleagues see you. What, tell us your name and tell us what that was like. The last time you got cursed out because you were trying to help someone. Um, I can tell about last year. I had a client that uh, decided. I worked in the senior center, and she decided that she wasn't going to take care of herself anymore. So we. Um, put into services to help her with the oh. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> One of my clients last year um, was doing neglect on herself and so we had to report to adult um, protective services and also just get her some services that she needed such as showering and food supply. And when I took her into the office to let her know that um, me as a naive, naive BSW so excited to tell my client that I got her all these services, she told me to F off. And <laughs> um, at that point, uh, I teared up um, and went into my office for a minute and collected myself. And then I went back to her and told her I was still giving her the services. <laughs> all right, you go ahead. Let's go ahead. Any other uh, experience where people you were trying to help did not receive your help in the most positive way? Anyone else? In the back, yes. Yes, a new 
good a white girl, right? That's all I'm saying. Anyone else? What about my African American friends? How many people have been accused of having sold out to the white man? Come on now. Yeah, now understand this, if you're African American, when you go out and you're working at the local, state, or federal agency, you will be accused by some African Americans, Hispanics, and other minorities of having sold them out. See, the, the street runs for white, right? Now, word up, young folks. <laughs> if you haven't been called a racist, it's just that you didn't hear it. <laughs> If you haven't, or you think you haven't been accused of selling out, you better think again. Oftentimes, almost invariably, you're going to have to confront the reality of your service. Oftentimes, the best deeds, my mother always told me, Mike, the good deeds you do will often go unnoticed and unappreciated. But you're not in this profession because of who or how or what rewards you think you might what? Receive. Are you? Why are you in this profession? <laughs> um, well, because based on She saw a need, and she wanted to talk. She wanted to feel the need. And so the reality is this. You will be appreciated, folks. And it's not like when you study for an exam and you always want to be appreciated at what? An A. But sometimes you just don't get a what? But does that mean the professor does not appreciate your effort? <laughs> Am I right, Rebecca? That's right. Yeah, but they, you know, effort is not excellence. <laughs> but effort is not excellence. But the fact is, you have to always give what? The effort. See, oftentimes the people you serve don't know how to say thank you. One of the things we found out and discovered at the Georgia Department of Labor, particularly over the last three or four years, is that many of the folks we serve, I mean, our folks were being cursed out and they were being accused of things because people were angry and they were upset and they were frustrated because they couldn't find a job and they were lashing out. So were they angry at us? Or were they just angry and frustrated about what? The world and the economy in which they were having to suffer through, right? So it's really not about you. So don't internalize it because the anger oftentimes is not about you. If you were unemployed for three years, and your bills are past due, your children are hungry, the repo man has already repossessed the car. No one will give you an interview. How would you feel? Angry, frustrated, right? You go join what? Either the two, the tea party or Occupy Wall Street. You're gonna do one or the other, am I right? Are and so is that about you or is it about who? It's about the people you're trying to serve. So what you have to do is come out of your own self and understand the needs of the individual, the men and women who are sitting in front of you at the desk. Is that fair? Because we did. We got in it because this is what I wanted to do. These are the things that I wanted to achieve. This is how I wanted to save the world and help this family, help this person. But it's not about us. It's always about whom? The people you're trying to serve. And you got to assume that many of the African Americans, they have experienced racism in their lives. You do understand it, though. Or at least they experience events or a situation that they perceive to have been what? Racist. And so consequently, or they've dealt with educated African Americans who, is, who have seemed to want to separate themselves, not like Dr. Daniel, from other African Americans who are not educated. 
See, I grew up in that. And when I was on the other side, I had a great suspicion, particularly of African Americans who would enroll here at the University of Georgia. They didn't think much of us. What y'all call us? Townies? Y'all don't still do that, do you? Ah, uh, you probably do. That was my daughter said, because she's a student here at the University of Georgia, and I understand what she says about the kids who are outside this graphite environment. So they're very suspicious of you. When you go home, think about when you go home on weekends. Many of the people you grew up with, you graduated from high school with, they now have a somewhat different attitude towards you. Am I not right? Have you had Tell us about it. See, we said we want it, but if you think about it, the only people we associate 
of people who are like us. And the people you're trying to serve when you go work in the school district, you know, you never spent a moment with someone other than the people who are just like you. And yet you get ready to go out there and, and communicate and, and inspire and transform folk that you never had in contact with. But I'll do it after I graduate. So what you waiting for? See, you all are different. I grew up in a completely segregated Athens, Georgia, until I was in 12th grade. Never had a conversation with a white person my age until I was a senior at Clark Central High School. And I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it had been that long ago. Am I right, Dr. Manning? So when I got over to Clark Central High School, I was very suspicious of my white classmates. You know why? I didn't know any white teenagers my age. Never associated with them, never went out to lunch with them, never did anything with anyone other than African American. So I had to engage in what I suggest you're going to have to do, and don't wait till you graduate, and that is expand your comfort zone. Now people are people, and generally people like to associate with other people who are what? Like them. Isn't that right? Isn't it kind of interesting, because if you are Kappa, all the Kappas on campus kind of hang out with the, the Kappas, and the AKAs hang out with the AKs, and the Deltas, and the KAs hang out with whom? Right? And, and, and the punk rockers and the heavy metal folk, they try to hang out with whom? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That's kind of human nature, and there's really nothing wrong with that. I'm not suggesting that you should abandon your comfort zone, but in order to be a successful social worker, in order to be a successful professional in this particular arena, you're going to have to expand your comfort zone. What I mean by that? Don't, don't give up your homeboys, right? You, you don't have to do that. But what you will have to do is engage other folk. When you have meetings, that's what I always say. When you go to meetings, you join an organization in school. You know, back in, in my day, it was the roller dance. And so you had certain names. And <laughs> he said, maybe you're that old. Well, you, know, you, know. <laughs> you remember we had roller dance, yeah, right? <laughs> but now you got what? The black man, right? Or whatever. IPhone. I got an iPhone. I don't know how you, but I got it. <laughs> I got it. And uh, make sure, look at the names and the addresses and the phone numbers you have in your Blackberry or your, or your iPhone and do a quick demographic profile analysis. And if all the people who are in your iPhone and your Blackberry basically have the same dem demographic profile of you, then you need to expand your what? Comfort zone. Plus, you're limiting yourself unnecessarily. Because if you're really committed to making a difference, doing what needs to get done, you're going to need the best and the brightest in order to what? To get it done. So everybody think about who's in the iPhone now. If it's only your sorority sister, you got issues. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> so expand your comfort zone. It, it takes courage to do it, though, right? What's the problem? What's the biggest problem you have in, 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 in expanding your comfort zone? Because you know, if you if you are African American at the University of Georgia and you hang out with the white folks too much, that can be what? 
that that could be a issue. <laughs> Am I right? See, y'all, y'all play with me. I have a daughter who is a senior at the University of Georgia. I know what's going on. You can't fool me. <laughs> right? Isn't that an issue? If you're in a certain sorority and you've got black friends, you might, matter of fact, you may not get invited to participate. Because basically, in the Greek life, the sorority, the fraternity, they're basically either all what or all what. They're either all what or all what. What do you think that is? What's that about? See, that is the biggest stumbling block to you achieving the goals you're setting for yourself. Because you will not be able to select the people you are going to do what? Serve. They will not be all black and they will not be all white. They will not be all Hispanic. Unlike the world you're living in, it's going to be extremely diverse. But all your experiences, all your basic social interactions have been directly defined by race. Am I making any sense or am I just making y'all feel not? What do you think? Martin Luther King said that like church is the most segregated place in America. If he didn't say it, he should have, but that's profound. <laughs> that's profound. It really is. Ah, what he said was Sunday morning at 11 a.m. is the most segregated hour in America. That's what he said, and that's a good point. All I'm asking you to do, nobody's perfect. I'm the perfect example of someone that had to expand the comfort zone. But I did it. I wish I could say I had this calling. But I just wanted to be successful in life. And in order to be successful in life, I recognized that I had to build some coalitions and develop some friendships that were much broader than the ones that I had been forced or either one that I volunteered to grow up with. And I'm encouraging you to do the same. See, I had an excuse. The law said that I couldn't do this. The law said that I could, when Tate Center was the old Tate Center, the law was we could never set foot over here. I took great pride this morning in walking in and standing on the street. I remember, but you do not have that excuse. Let me tell you about America today. America today is on a major economic stretch, and it's going to impact how you do your job. The system that you will work in, the post-depressionary system, whether it's Social Security, whether it's the health system, whether it's the unemployment insurance system, all of these are getting ready to be dramatically transformed. That's what I come to tell you. What you have been studying in many ways, the history of social welfare and the human service delivery system is being, getting ready to be radically transformed. And the reason it's going to be transformed is that government at the federal, state, and local level can no longer afford to finance it the way it's been financed historically. That's not the way I want it. If I was king of the world, that's not the way I would do it. But trust me, the budget crisis is going to have a great impact on you and the people you serve. The first impact in terms of you is that it's going to be much tougher for you to even get a job when you graduate. You do understand this, right? See, this is not just about the people on the other side of town. This is about the people in this room. I bought some information for who's graduating this year. Raise your hand. Let me see. Helping you and helping the people you serve to become employed will become the most critical issue of this century. Unemployed young people, 24, age, 24 years of young, unemployment at its highest rate on record. Now young people, 24 years of young, with college degrees, doing better. But their unemployment rates 
are the highest rates on record. When America is not working, taxes are not being collected. When taxes are not being collected, then human service, social welfare programs will not be funded or they'll be refunded and funded at much reduced levels. If there's less funding in state and local government, that means there will be less and fewer who? Employees. This is not just about the poor folk on the other side of town. This is about all of us. The social security system will be reduced and cut back. Eligibility will be increased. In December, you're getting ready to see uh, President Obama and the Republicans in the House of Representatives, I predict, will radically change the unemployment insurance program. Because collectively, the states owe the federal government now nearly $40 billion in unemployment benefits that have been paid out with no money to cover the costs. What we saw with welfare reform in the 90s, where the old, TANIC pro, where the old uh, AFDC program was transformed to the TANIC program, will ripple all through this system. Those of you who will be most successful, and you will all be successful, but those of you who will be most successful will be the ones who can innovate, will create new ideas and new strategies, not to abolish, and that's why I take issue with my friends on the right. They think that the solution is to abolish human social service programs and human service delivery programs. The problem, the challenge is not to abolish them. That doesn't take any innovation. That doesn't require any intelligence. The challenge is, how do you take these depression era programs and re-engineer, re-envision, and redeploy them so that they can become more effective and efficient in a 21st century environment? So you will be asked to do something much different than the generations who graduated before you. For them, they could go, they could get a job, they could work in a job, maybe stay 25, 30 years and retire. You will be asked to transform these jobs. The thing, and we wanted to talk a minute about Georgia Works, and it's interesting. Eight years passed from the moment I was sitting at my breakfast table, and when I articulated, I told my wife, I got an idea. Eight years passed from that moment, Dr. Davis, from the moment I spoke to my wife, to the moment President Obama called a joint session of Congress and endorsed the concept of Georgia Works. Eight years. But in that eight year period, every, just about every government entity, just about anyone who could tell me no, said what? No. Opposed because they thought it was immoral to suggest that people who were unemployed, receiving unemployment insurance benefits, should also have the opportunity to go out and help create themselves a job. Because they said, no, that's not what this program is about. This is about providing benefits to the unemployed. But what? is the most critical thing that an unemployed person needs. It's a job. So you all will be asked to be innovators, to be creators, and to think beyond where you are now into the future. In order to do it, you're going to have to be in a coalition we talked about. You, what you really want is to associate yourself with the best man, regardless of race, regardless of color, regardless of creed. What you really want are the creative thinkers who can create the new human service delivery system in the 21st century, which by definition will be much more cost effective and much more efficient. Because if it's not, it will not exist. If you want to do good, you got every opportunity to do it. You're blessed to be graduating into this environment because now you can make changes that were not even considered in the past. 
You can do things that other people would have immediately told you and shot you down and said no. And I'll leave you with this, and then I'll take a few questions. Matter of fact, I'll take a few questions first. Thank you all. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was what? Comfortable. 
I cursed my faith. I just didn't have enough black folk to win. The first time I lost by a couple of hundred votes, second time I lost by 112 votes, and I'm like, man, if I can find me 113 more black folk, <laughs> I am on my way to the legislature. And I looked everywhere. We registered all the black folk we could find. Y'all know how to go. And uh, we found a guy passed out drunk on the street corner over in East Athens. But, and I signed him up. We carried him in behind down to the courthouse and signed him up. And it was a good deal on election day. He was drunk on the same street corner. I carried him in. I voted him. I still couldn't win. And I swear to God, this is true. Because I like the research. I know I'm a writer. So I'm like, I need 113 more black people. And so then I began to study the fertility rate of black women in Clark County, Georgia. <laughs> I was trying to determine if my district might become. And it was a good news, bad news scenario. The good news that yes it will, the bad news that it was going to occur in 2066. <laughs> I'm like, what can I do? I mean, I'm, then I had an epiphany. One night I woke up in, my, in the middle of the sleep and I had an epiphany. Something I hadn't thought about. I think I asked white people to vote for me too. It was free. It was free. You know how sometimes you sit around trying to figure out how to solve this problem, and all your resources are the people you know, right? It happens all the time. Let Let's do something about homelessness. Let's do something about education. And then you look in the room, and the only people in the room are you and the people you know. So I decided that I was going to break out of, 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 of this, this mental, emotional jail that I had built, built for myself, and that we were going to campaign door to door all over there, because I was going wherever to vote for. I'm getting ready to get elected. And so Homewood Hill was in my district. At that time, it was all white, upper income. So I said, let's go. I took my sister with me, and knocked on the door, and elderly, well-dressed, intelligent, looking white lady came to the door. And my sister handed her my brochure and she was smiling and, and I was smiling. I'm like, man, I should have thought of it two elections ago. And she started reading my brochure and she opened it up and as she began to read, the smile turned to the frown. Then she got to my picture and the frown turned to a scrap. And she literally threw the brochure back at us. And she said, y'all are wasting your time. She said, I'll never vote for one of them. She said, they lied and cheat this deal. There's nothing you can say that will ever get me to vote for one of those people. Well, my heart literally broke in my chest. And I turned and walked away, committed never, ever again to cross these railroad tracks. When I got to the street, I realized my sister was not with me. And I looked back, and my sister said, hold up, lady. She said, haven't you ever heard of the Civil Rights Movement? And I'm like, we get ready to go to jail today. <laughs> she said, you can't judge my little brother simply by the color of his skin. And the little lady took the brochure, and she read it again. She says, honey, I don't care what color you are, I'll never vote for a damn lawyer. <laughs> The reason we don't reach out, the reason we don't build a coalition is not because of what other people are thinking, it's because of what we think. It's not what they say and what they think, it's what we think they are saying. Next question. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, in the back. And she voted today. Give her a hand. That's all right. Yeah. I just was struck by how you were talking about innovation in social services and the need for that. And I'm certainly all for that as a social worker. Um, however, just when we're talking about 
overall tax revenue and how it's divided. I think that it's really important to, for us to all have awareness and draw attention to the amount of money we spend on war versus social services. So I almost think it's kind of a, a line from, you know, from people who are kind of anti-social services to say that this is the amount of money we have and we have to make do with this. Like, we're making a lot of choices about where those divisions come from and, and all that. So I just wondered if you could speak to that. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay. I agree with you. The reality is the political environment is extremely conservative. You have the President of the United States, who I support, who is a Democrat, and members of the Senate who are Democrats who are advocating for major cuts at the federal level. Now, it's not that I support it, but the reality is that when it happens and it's going to happen, you have to engage the process. You cannot walk away. It's not true in the School of Social Work, but it's said that it's easier to change the course of history than it is to change the course in a history department. <laughs> Church say amen. <laughs> Not only will you have to innovate with new ideas and new strategies, it's what Dr. Daniels is doing in terms of health disparities. Health is going to be a huge issue going forward. The health legislation will not be repealed. The question is how now at the local and state level can we engage and, in, and engineer and deploy this new legislation in a way so that it fits within a budget reality. There will be less money to operate on. That's just a fact. You can wish for something different, but it's not going to happen. It's what we really decided in welfare reform. If welfare was going to be reformed, then we should be the reformers. Don't let people who, who, who despise social work and social workers and, and, and helping people to author and write and implement the strategy. You have to do it. But if you put your hands in the pocket because my position did not gain a majority in Washington, then you will have done yourself and the people you serve a disservice. Don't wait. You must innovate. You know there are ways to do things much more effectively than the way it's being done right now. You do know it. But you cannot be afraid to engage. Don't let the opposition define your future and the future of this country. Thank you all so much.